you're okay. Yeah, yeah just make sure you're, you're supposed to check in after every meal. And you probably didn't do that because you were late. So after every meal, you just got to check in. Okay. Just make sure I acknowledge you. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Like John. Be like John. Be like John. John. <laughs> Just two quick announcements. Number one, uh, don't forget the auditions. I think we've got about 15 auditions are after this, isn't it? 3.30, no, 3 o'clock? Yeah. And then also, if you want to play spike ball, um, that's at 3.30. And where is that again? Someone just literally just told me. Where do you want to meet? Meet here. Meet here at 3.30. Well, not in this room. Just but Yeah, by the whiteboard at 3.30 for spike ball. And okay? Okay. Well, let's stand and sing hymn number 132. Wondrous King, all glorious, sovereign Lord, victorious. How many of you like America? I thought so. What a, what, a, what, a, what a great country. That's okay to say that, isn't it? 
It's okay to say that? It, it, here's why it's okay to say that, because we're a grateful people. We're, we're grateful, aren't we? Are you all grateful for America? Yeah. yeah. Grateful for the heritage, grateful for the freedoms that we enjoy. We have a sense that things are slipping. I ran for governor of the state of Colorado in 1994. I lost. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> One reason why, you know, you shift a focus in your calling, and it turned out mine was not in politics. But, uh, but I was interested in bringing God's principles into the area of the civil magistrate. I thought it would be important to do that. At the time, the Republican leadership in my state was largely, we call them rhinos, uh, Republican name only, so there, there were very few pro-lifers. And so I, I ran an independent ticket as a pro-life candidate against uh, two candidates that were very much in favor of killing babies and having the government pay for that. And, and so I made something of an issue out of that and gained 4% of the vote. And the Democrat walked away with the election, but there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between the two parties anyway. And, and so that, that did shift things in uh, American or uh, Colorado politics in the 1990s somewhat. So I'm thankful for uh, what I was able to do. But uh, we're going to talk about history in this section. We're going to talk about political liberties. Uh, there are key moments in history in which, by God's providence, the direction of history is shifted. God brings about very dramatic and important events in history, when things are very, very bad and something happens, God is at work. He brings His powerful workings to bear in human history and He, he, he brings Himself all the glory and the praise. And, and so we think of, of, of the great release of God's people from the political bondage of Egypt. And, and here is a, a picture, of course, it is the picture of our redemption the great Old Testament picture of what God is going to do through Christ 2,000 years later. But, but there you have a 400-year period in which the Lord is setting up a, a very dramatic moment. He brings His people to Egypt. That's part of the plan. 400 years earlier in which over a period of time they're enslaved. And at the same time, uh, the Egyptian empire becomes... This, the most powerful empire in history and, and to that point. The Egypt, Egypt is building its big pyramids. That's when the, the largest pyramids come together. That's the point at which the Egyptian pharaohs are pushing down into Sudan and then up into Canaan. And they're gaining more power upwards towards Syria. And it's the largest, most powerful influence that Egypt ever had. So we see the building of the empire by God's ordination the, the, the largest empire on earth to that point is, is forming itself, building its large pyramids, and God's people are enslaved in Egypt. And then, and then the Lord pulls out His man Moses to, to lead His people out of Egypt. And, and there you, you have an a, a accentuation of the, of the hardness of the heart of Pharaoh, and, and Pharaoh is getting, as it were, angrier. So here you have a very powerful man, the most powerful man on earth, and his, his anger towards God's people are ratcheting up. He's the hardest of hearts. He becomes the maddest of the mad as, as, as God's people are preparing to lead, leave Egypt. And of course, there is, the, uh, there is the death of the firstborn throughout Egypt, and, and this is the point at which there seems to be a, a even more desperate opposition to God and His people on the part of Pharaoh and his armies, and so as God's people are, are there by the Red Sea, and there's a mountain to the left, mountain to the right, and, and this large army led by the maddest man on earth uh, descending upon them, they're without any ability to defend themselves, they're slaves, they, they don't have an army, uh, there's just a man there at the Red Sea with a stick in the air, and, uh, and, and he's, he's looking at everybody and saying, watch this. And they're not impressed at this point. But, but this is the point at which, which God enters the scene. It, it's the most desperate moment. And, 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 and this, is the, this is the picture of our redemption. Where Moses has got that rod in the air and you're wondering, what he's, is he thinking? You know, is this going to work? I hope this works at this very key moment in history. And by faith, 
Moses raises that rod, and God parts the waters and delivers his people in the most astounding, most amazing picture of redemption. And this is playing out over, say, 400 years, and millions of people going through the Red Sea. It's not as if anybody could miss this moment, you know. It's, it's, it's played out on a very large screen, as it were. Very dramatic, very important, very significant. Warrants itself uh, major motion pictures in Hollywood in the 1950s as well. I mean, this, this, this is something that you don't forget. This is something that a prostitute in Jericho is still speaking about 40 years later. This is, this is the smash and this is the crushing of an empire. Egypt never comes back to defend its position. Uh, later you get the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Persians, and so you, it move, power moves more to the Mesopotamian valley, but Egypt never comes back to its heights. Why? Because God crushes the enemy. And, and again, 40 years later, the kings of the, in the Canaanite areas are writing letters, the famous Amarna tablets to the Pharaoh asking for help from the Habiru invasion of Canaan. And so they're asking for help from the Pharaoh. He can't help them. Why? Because his, his armies, his empire, the, the back of his empire was broken at the Red Sea 40 years earlier. And 400 years later, the witch doctors of the Philistines are still talking about what happened 400 years earlier when God's people were redeemed and saved from the power of Egypt. This is impressive. Isn't this, isn't this amazing? This, this, this is the picture of redemption. This is the setting of the captives free. This is God winning. If there's a message that we get from history is what? God wins. Christ has won. And we are redeemed. So, brothers and sisters, this is the picture of the Christian life. When, when something is going very badly, something very good happens because God enters the scene. God does something. When, when, when we are at the end of our rope, when we were still sinners, lost in sin, overwhelmed by the devil, in, in bondage to, to our sin, destined for hellfire forever, God intervenes. God sends His only begotten Son in the nightmare of our sin and misery and corruption and degradation and humiliation and condemnation with the specter of that eternal death hanging over us. Christ died for us. That's the story of, of history. Now we're going to talk about political tyranny for a little bit. What is it about political tyranny? It's a manifestation of the demonic tyranny itself. It's an external manifestation of the tyranny of the devil. And political tyranny is, is a terrible thing. And I think it would be good for all of us to recognize, even as the, the tyranny of the devil in keeping a man in bondage to his idolatry or to pornography or to addictions or whatever sin it happens to be, that's a terrible thing. It's a horrible thing. Political tyranny is a terrible thing. The 20th century was really an awful century. And I do think we need to be students of history. We, we need to remember history. We need to remember what happened when common grace was pulled back from the Soviet Union and, and in Eastern Europe and, and for Germany. And, and for a time, there, God allowed for the evil of man's hearts to demonstrate itself in a more demonstrative way than we have seen in a thousand years. We're looking at as many as 200 million people lost their lives because of communism, because of Marxism, because the American seminaries and American colleges and universities that were ostensibly run by Christians refused to stand up against Karl Marx and Charles Darwin and Nietzsche and all the rest of them because, because they didn't oppose these great Nephilim, the great philosophers and the, the thinkers, the the men who apostatized from the Christian faith in the 19th century and then had a, a lot of influence upon modern thinking, psychology, philosophy, political science, and, uh, and there has not been, as I see it, much of an opposition to this. That's why I wrote Apostate, the men who destroyed the Christian West, because I was trying to inspire some opposition to the ideas that have been so corrupting. And there's been so little in the Protestant church that has stood against 
these great and powerful Nephilim that have done so much damage in the 20th century and 21st century could be worse. I've, I've just come back from the East and they suffered under the communists. And they're still in shock. They're still in paralysis over the massive destructive influence that Marxism had upon the family and upon society and upon economies. I'm telling you that tyrants can break the back. They can kill people. They can ruin society. They, in fact, Karl Marx, in the little section in Apostate I wrote on his biography, he associated himself with Apollyon. He would, he, would, he would like to call himself Apollyon in his prose, meaning he identified so much. I think he could have been possessed by Satan himself. I think there's a very strong possibility that some of these men were so influenced that they might have been possessed, at least for a time, by Satan himself. Because he's so identified with Apollyon. Apollyon, the, 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 the definition of Apollyon is the destroyer. And, and the agenda of Karl Marx and communism and these, these demonic systems that are imposed upon the modern secular world is just destructive. It's just, that's the one word I have for it. It's just, if, if you want to go out and just destroy people and destroy societies, destroy economies, then, then get Karl Marx into the universities and get him into the political systems. So I'm just telling you, political tyranny is a terrible thing. It involves torture, retortured for Christ, if you want to understand the kinds of tyranny that uh, Christians have suffered under. That's uh, Richard Wormbrand's book, and the movie is actually very good. I, I think it's, it's, it's extremely powerful. Uh, but the fear mongering, the sovereignty of the state, cameras everywhere, monitoring every move you make, every breath you take. I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that tyranny does to you. So I'm just saying, guys, this is not something that we just want to say, okay, like whatever, man. The, the ratting on neighbors, on the part of neighbors, the obliteration of trust in the communities, the murders of millions upon millions, these are the sorts of things that tyranny bring to the world. Well, we are losing our liberties here. That's where we are right now. I described a little bit of that this morning. The federal government now ratcheting it up quite a bit, as much as FDR did. This is the largest increase in government, the largest move towards socialism and total communism in America that we've seen since FDR. It's bitter, bigger than LBJ. It's bigger than all the others. So this is the biggest move on our watch in the last year or two. This is the biggest increase in political influence in, in America and Canada that we, we've seen in our lifetime. Crisis is usually the context for socialism, more government. There's always, you know, a crisis and a government steps in. Here, we'll fix the problem for you. We'll monitor everybody. We'll take, take over all the health care issues and we will test everybody and inoculate and vaccine everybody. Here, we'll fix that. Whenever there's a crisis, health crisis, an economic crisis, always an excuse for more government. That's, that's what they do. Generally, the process also is government steps in and says, we will control it, we will fund it, and then they inevitably pervert it. So they'll fund education first, they'll fund it through the Title IX uh, programs with the uh, private Christian colleges, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll fund it and control it first, and then they will mandate a transgendering of the bathrooms and the rest. That, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, first, controlling health care, and then mandating euthanasia. So these are the steps. First, controlling uh, health care and then, and then funding hundreds of billions of dollars in abortion and, uh, and non-copay forms of abortifacient and such. So that, that's the way governments do it. That's the way the destructive agenda works. So here's a question for you. You think that governments could cl close our churches? What do you think? I'm talking about in America or Canada. Do you think governments could actually step in? If I asked that question a year ago or a year and a half ago, what would we say? If I said, okay, do you think governments could shut down churches in America, like wholesale, like all the churches in a given state, where the government just steps in and says, we're shutting down the churches? It would be hard to believe that they, they would do the sorts of things they're doing this year. Or if a government would kill 
80 million babies, or at least oversee the, the abortions to the tune of tens of millions, even 80 million babies, why won't this government kill you? You ever, you ever think about that? Or why wouldn't this government kill Christians? We have had an increasingly anti-Christian culture since roughly 2008. I, I put the different cultural analysis uh, will, will put these, this date in a little different place. But America in the West was primarily a pro-Christian morality, a pro-Christian culture at, at the highest echelons for hundreds of years. Um, it turned more or less neutral in the 1990s, the 2000s. But by 2008, uh, Christians have been the target. We have become the target. We are the enemy of the mass culture. So it would not surprise me if a, a fairly intensive form of persecution came upon Christians. At first, it was Christian businessmen who, who were being shut down, Christian funeral homes, Christian adoption agencies, Christian colleges, that's where it starts, eventually works its way into other forms. It's, it's a violation of private property first, that is government step in and say, you need to accommodate these folks in your floral business or your cake making business for, the, for weddings, you need to accommodate, we will control you, we'll regulate uh, who you do business with. So it's a, a control, it's, it's taking, it's a violation of the Eighth Commandment that is taking control of your assets or your capital, and, and forcing you to do what you do not want to do in good conscience. So it's a violation of private property first. It's, church, it's, it's government stepping into churches and, and shutting down churches because they haven't complied with certain accommodation laws uh, for homosexuality or whatever it is. So this is, this is the tyranny that we speak of. Let me uh, give you a quick biblical definition of liberty. We talked about tyranny, let's talk about liberty. By the way, these things are in my book, The Story of Freedom, uh, if anybody is interested, and this, I think, is one of the most amazing stories of what Christ has done throughout history. But, you know, ultimately, freedom or liberty has to be defined by God's law. Freedom is not the freedom to kill other people or the freedom to, to get drunk, uh, the freedom to do whatever I want to do. That's, that's not a biblical definition of freedom. Freedom, ultimately, is, is a freedom or a liberty from sin, our Lord said in John chapter 8, if the Son will set you free, you will be free indeed. So God's law limits power. See, it sets the boundary for jurisdictional authority. Um, the laws like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, apply not just to us, but to governments. Governments don't have a moral right to walk into your house and just shoot you and your kids. They, they don't have a moral right to do that, but why? Because God's law is still in stone. Because God's law applies as much to governments as it does to individuals. And God lays out jurisdictional authorities. Now, the modern humanist view of things is that, that the state or government is everything. Government is everything. And the government allows for the family and the church to have certain freedoms or certain rights within the jurisdiction of the government that is in control of all things. But that's not our worldview. Our worldview is this, this isn't the government, this is God. God is, is in control. God is over all. Government's not over all. Governments are under God. And God is over all. God is the ultimate sovereign. He's the lawgiver. He's the one who, who delegates authority to these various jurisdictional spheres. And so within this sphere, God has established the state the family and the church with their jurisdictional responsibilities. And when they violate those responsibilities, when a, when, a, when a father beats on his kid and kills his wife or whatever, that's a violation of God's law. He doesn't have a right to do that. And so, so here's, here's the definition for, for liberty. It's, it's God's law that limits the power, the power of government's the power of each and every one of us in our respective spheres. God's law really does apply to a police officer in Minneapolis, for example. We did an entire program on, on how God's law would apply to a police officer's beating on a guy in Minneapolis and uh, how you would adjudicate a case given two or three witnesses, given this and that. Uh, how would you adjudicate the case given God's law? 
And without God's law, I, I don't know how you would, where you would start. That's why it's so important for us to, to have God's law as the standard. God's law really does apply to Planned Parenthood, even if it's supported by $20 billion of tax monies. God's law is still in charge. God's justice is good justice. The confusion in our denominations, the confusion concerning white privilege and concerning reparations and social justice, these things that are dividing the Southern Baptists and the PCA, to me, can be resolved rather easily if, if we could agree that God's law is the standard. And if we were a little better at discipling the nations in all that God has commanded us in His Word, I, I believe that if we had a commitment to the commandments of God, if we kept the faith of Jesus, if we keep the commandments of God as Christians are defined in the most simplistic way in Revelation 14, 12, if, if, if we defined ethics by God's law and we could agree on this, I doubt if there would be the divisions we see in their denominations today. Well, briefly, a biblical defense of liberty. Political liberty, what is it? Well, it's not the highest value. It's not the highest value because the children of Israel, the Jews in the New Testament, they, they were always after political liberties. They wanted liberty from the Assyrians or from the Babylonians or from the Romans. And, and yet Christ comes to them in John 8 and said, if the Son will set you free, you will be free indeed. And saying that you're, you're the servants of the devil, you're servants of sin. And that's the ultimate tyranny. And as long as you're a servant of sin, then you are in bondage. You're in the ultimate bondage. That's, that's the, the ultimate reason why Christ came, to set us free from sin. And to die on the cross for our sins, for our redemption, from the bondage of, of our sins. 1 Corinthians 7, 21 to 23 is the key passage. If you have your Bibles, you might take a look at that. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 21 to 23. There Paul speaking about what I would call the servants to the unnecessary servitude of men. That this being in bondage to the unnecessary servitude of men. There are points at which we cannot be free, and Paul's admitting to that here in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, if you're called while a slave, that if you become a Christian while you're a slave, don't be concerned about it, but if you can be made free, use it rather. So in other words, what Paul is saying is we don't engage in unlawful revolutions, we don't kill our slave masters, uh, but, but if we have the option. And by the way, Philemon is a great book in this regard because Philemon is not something that the socialists, the Marxists, the revolutionaries of the 19th century are very happy with. But Paul is not encouraging revolution, he's rather encouraging a, a lawful, charitable, peaceable release of slavers. So that's what he's after with Philemon. But, but, but the, the, the value, the thing that's important is to be free from the unnecessary servitude of men. And that, now, it turns out that we can be enslaved to local fiefdoms, we can be enslaved to you know, these little local plantations, or we could be enslaved to large socialist communist states. And there's all sorts of forms of slavery to, to humans that, uh, that the devil has come up with uh, through the years. And there are points at which um, people cannot be freed immediately from these conditions. And yet, Paul is saying that's a value, that's something to seek after. And why? And this is really interesting. He says, use it rather. If you can be free, if you can seek that freedom, it is worthwhile. Why? Because, he says, you've been bought with a price. Don't be the servants of men. In other words, you, you've been bought, been bought by the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. You, 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 your, your value, your, the freedom and the value of your freedom is, is so intensive that it required the blood of the Son of God to bring about your redemption. And if that be the case, if you've been redeemed from, from sin and the devil, then, man, you don't subject yourself to the tyranny of men. Don't do it. Don't do it. The, 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 the struggle for freedom is, is of value. It is, it's an important thing. Our founders would say things like this, uh, Benjamin Franklin, if you'll either be go governed by God or by God you'll be governed. He says, either you'll be governed by God's laws 
Either you'll be governed by the principles of God's word, you'll be self-governed, or by the providence of Almighty God, you will remain in tyranny. See, that, that's, that's, what the, that's the thinking of our founders. It comes from a Proverbs, by the transgression of the people, or by the transgressions of the land, many are the princes thereof. In other words, because of the transgressions of the people, as long as people are addicted to the pornography, as long as they're destroying their families, as long as they're getting divorced from their wives, and they have this dysfunctional social condition because of all the immoralities in their life, they're going to be tyrannized to the umpteenth degree. That's just going to happen. And that's precisely what we see as we see the percentage of children born without fathers rise from 1% to 57% over the last century. What do we see with governments? Governments increase from roughly controlling 2 to 3% of the people's income up to 50% of the people's income over the same period of time. So inevitably, these things come together. So what could possibly provide freedom? I mean, how in the world will the world ever see freedom but that Christ has come to set the captives free? But that the gospel is preached and people receive the gospel. They're redeemed and, and they're regenerated. So, it, so we can't shake off our political bonds by sheer revolution, which was attempted with, by the French and sometimes by the Marxists and others, it comes by regeneration. But it's a value. It's still a value. Our founders like Samuel Adams would say, if you love your wealth more than liberty, if you love the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, depart from us in peace. We ask not your counsel under your arms, and may your chains rest lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were our countrymen. You know, that kind of spirit is pretty amazing. And Samuel Adams is probably one of the most committed Christians. His family was discipled by the teachings of George Whitfield and others. His sister would come home when he was a kid and share the sermons of George Whitfield with him. And uh, he is by far the most evangelical of the founders, him and Patrick Henry. We tell the stories of that in American faith, and you need to read the stories of these great Christian men who fought tooth and nail for our freedoms uh, at the founding of this nation, but I think much of it came about because of the Great Awakening. I, I can't imagine we would have been free, that we would have any kind of freedom from the uh, tyranny of, of England at the time. I don't think we would have made a, a step towards the Bill of Rights. And by the way, that was a battle to gain that little piece of paper, first out of the Virginia Convention, thanks to Patrick Henry. And then once again to Samuel Adams in his debates in the 1789, 80, 88, 89 period. It was Samuel Adams again. It was Patrick Henry again who stepped up to the microphone one last time to defend the Bill of Rights and to get it into our Constitution and praise God for that. How many court cases have defended godly people seeking freedom at some level simply because of that single piece of paper that came about through guys like Patrick Henry and Samuel Adams so praise God for the great Western liberties that we have enjoyed for the last number of years. And I say this is the, probably the best story or one of the very best demonstrations of the influence of Jesus Christ upon a very dark world. The story of Western liberties, the rise and fall of the West, the story of the rise of Western liberties from the Magna Carta on into the Scottish War for Independence, and then on into the Dutch War for Independence. Guys, these are amazing stories. They all pave the way to our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It comes from the Magna Carta. Read the story. I know we're losing our freedoms. I get that. I understand that. We're, we're letting it all go. I, I see it happening all around us. But I'm hoping, I'm praying that God, by His grace, would retain something of the legacy by these books, by our children, our grandchildren that can at least read of 800 years of a battle for Christian liberties in, in, this, in this world, that, that maybe someday it might arise one more time. I just pray that somehow in the hearts and minds of some of our children, some of our grandchildren, maybe our grand, great-grandchildren, they'll, they'll uncover the Magna Carta. They, they will find the work that Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry did in the establishment of our liberties in this country. Oh, that this would be the case. You know, when I was describing the influence of Christ upon the world in our ninth grade, uh, taking the world for Jesus, I, I, I published this with another evangelical publishing house, and on the back of it, I put, the world will never be the same. 
And the editors came back. They had a different eschatological approach. And they said, I don't think that's true. I think, you know, Antichrist is coming, whatever it was. And I, they, they said, take it off. Take it off the back cover. And I said, no. Uh-uh. Christ has come. Christ has come. He's been here. And look at everything he's done. The world will never be the same. And it stays on the cover. Because the story of what Jesus has done, I think we should tell the story. I don't care how pessimistic your eschatology is. I still think you should give Christ some credit. Amen? Should we give Christ the credit for what he's done? Certainly in spreading the gospel around the world, but what about the institutional changes that happened over 800 years to bring about some of the most amazing liberties, Christian liberties, over that period of time? I, I think this is the best story. It's, it's a positive story, how God has really blessed the world. Christ has been here, and this is what he's done. And what we do in the rise and the fall of the West is we contrast what Christ has done to what the miserable humanists have done to bring back the tyranny. To bring back the corruption of science, the corruption of culture, the destruction of civilization. Yeah, we see what the humanists are doing, but at the very least, let's read the story of what Christ did over at least a thousand years in bringing something good to our world. If we have a modicum of gratefulness. If you're kind of grateful, yeah, yeah I'm so glad that we weren't raised in gulags, you know. I'm, I'm glad my grandfathers and my fathers weren't tortured to death in communist prisons. You know, you got some gratefulness. You go, yeah, this is good. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. Look around me. This is good stuff. I think it's important for us to wake up and realize these blessings that God has given to us. I truly can't believe that, that all of what Christ has done is going to be unraveled. I don't believe that at all. No, no. I, I personally think that whatever's happening right now in this rebellion against God and multiple levels everywhere. And we've seen it. I, I get that. We, as Christians, have lost some cultural influence. I, I think this is going to be over. It, Christ rules on the right hand of the Father. He's going to bring these things down. Now, I don't know exactly what the time frame is, but, but these enemies just don't get the upper hand over Jesus. You know, Jesus versus Joe Biden. Okay? Who's going to win? I mean, that's simple, right? Jesus versus the most powerful man, or almost the most powerful man, except for the Chinese premier. But okay, Joe Biden versus Jesus. Who's going to win? Jesus versus Planned Parenthood. Who's going to win? I know it's just a matter of time. So be encouraged, friends. Be encouraged. What's amazing to me is I see how God uses single people. God uses sometimes one man, one woman, in key moments of history to do absolutely amazing things. People have asked me, what's, what's the greatest exemplar of courage and faith post the Apostle Paul in Christian history? And we like to play this game, but for me, it's John Wycliffe. I think John Wycliffe is the man, a, a man of tremendous courage. And what's in, interesting about John Wycliffe is, you know, he is alone. He's pre-John Hoos. He is, he is alone. There's nobody with him. He has a little bit of political power at the beginning, but he stay, takes a stand against transubstantiation. What happens? As he stands against transubstantiation, takes a stand against the Pope. What happens? He loses all his political power, everything. One man, literally one man against the world. I, I don't know of anybody who's with him at the end of his life, as in nobody. One man against the whole world. And look what God did with Jan Hus. Look what happened to Martin Luther. 120 years later. It sends the chills up and down my back of how God raises up John Wycliffe, who trains a few law lords, and then they pave the way into Poland and elsewhere for a reformation. And the rest is history. Uh, but let me uh, just briefly talk about a few other examples. William Wallace, Braveheart of Scotland. Why is this important? Well, because you have... The devil doesn't give up so easily. He, he, he wants to retain tyrannical hold on the people. He wants to retain tyrannical hold on the church. And, and much of the Scottish War for Independence in the 1290s with William Wallace was really a push against the English church and the Roman church that was pressing hard against the Scottish church. Because remember, the Irish established their own church. And it was much more evangelical and had much more of a, of a substance to it to disciple the nations over the previous 800 years. And so there was this 
intent to control all of Scotland through the political powers of England, through the Pope, and you know that the Pope uh, excommunicated Robert the Bruce, and you know what happened to William Wallace, he was training for the ministry, and he took up the battle against the, Sc against the English powers and uh, lost his head for it and was drawn and quartered in England while he was reading the Psalter. As he was reading the Psalter, they killed him. But then Robert the Bruce rises up. And here is a, a man of courage, a man of faith, a man who was excommunicated by the Pope, yes, but all of the English clerics or the Scottish clerics said, don't worry about what the Pope says. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so that was pretty common. The Pope actually excommunicated the um, Archbishop uh, during the Magna Carta, and he excommunicated all of England during that time. But uh, all of the priests and the, the pastors and the bishops says, don't worry about the Pope. The Pope doesn't know what he's talking about. Just sign the document. Just sign the document. So thankfully, there was always this pushback against the tyranny of Rome on the part of the Magna Carta in 1215. And then fast forward into about 1300, there's Robert the Bruce. The story about Robert the Bruce is, is really so interesting. And I draw a, a, a lot out of it in my book on the story of freedom because there's this instance in which Robert the Bruce had been overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed by these forces. All of his men were scattered. He was all by himself, wandering the hill and the dale over Scotland, and he winds up at a widow's house. And he comes to the widow's house, knocks on the door, and he said, I need a little room and board for the night. She says, I only give room and board to any follower of the rightful king of Scotland, Robert the Bruce. He said, I am that man. She said, you are that man. Where are your men? He says, I have none. She says, I have three sons. It's a beautiful story. And then he begins to get in, in, back into the, the conflict against this foreign power that was overcoming his nation, and uh, eventually Bannockburn. And Bannockburn is the key battle. How many of you heard the Battle of Bannockburn? That's, a, that's an amazing story. Wow. Uh, they, they pull their troops together. You know, there's three, four, five thousand of the Scots, and there's the 15,000 of the, the Brits coming down after them. And uh, they have two sermons. They preach two sermons from the book of Isaiah uh, to, to the men on the Scottish side. And so the pastors preach the sermon from the book of Isaiah, and uh, they, they start heading out into battle. And so they're heading out into battle, and uh, the English king is watching. He's talking to his right-hand man as they're coming to battle. And suddenly they all kneel down. And the king of Scotland said, oh, look, they kneel for me. And his right-hand man said, not for you, sir. Not for you. They bowed before Almighty God and they prayed together. And you all know they won the battle, don't you? Anyway, the this, this story of how, how God brings back the victory for the independence of Scotland and uh, the declaration of independence of Scotland just becomes something of a pattern for our country as well. Fast forward to the 1540s, 1550s, William the Silent, one of my favorite stories. Uh, and, of course, that leads to the Dutch uh, de Declaration of Independence, which is very much a pattern for our Declaration of Independence as well. But you know the Inquisition came upon, Den upon the Netherlands uh, in the 1540s, 1550s. Uh, King Philip said, I will, I will bring an Inquisition that will be double the force of the Spanish Inquisition upon the Reformed in the Netherlands. So that was his commitment. Uh, when the silent was raised in the household of Philip II. Did you know that? He was raised in the household of the emperor. He was Protestant root, but raised in the household of the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And he was much like Moses, made the stadtholder or the governor of the Netherlands. And he was on a hunting party in Paris with the king of France. The king of France had had a conversation with the emperor uh, Philip. And he, he, he told him what was going to happen. He says, the emperor has planned an inquisition to wipe out the reformed and to, to burn at the stake tens of thousands. In your, in your country, the Netherlands. And at that point, William was silent. And that's how he got the name William the Silent. At that very point, he was silent. And inside, he was boiling hot. Inside, he said he had committed to spend every ounce of everything he had and everything that God had given him to wipe the Spanish vermin out of his country and to save his people from that desperate tyranny. And, you know, the rest of the story is the only man that I know that gave up everything. Gave up everything. He, he was a man of tremendous position. Gave up the governorship. 
He gave up all of his belongings, gave up all his political holdings. He, uh, he contributed everything to hire mercenaries to defend his poor people who were, and there were entire families that were taken to the stake. It was a horrible inquisition. The stories that I relate in my book are just absolutely horrendous. Entire families burned at the stake live as they were crying out to Jesus for the, their salvation. I mean, it was tyranny at its worst in at least uh, since the Roman tyrannies. I don't think I, I, you'll find any tyranny as bad as what the Dutch Inquisition amounted to. But by God's grace, this man gave up everything he had. He gave up his wife. He gave up his son who was kidnapped to, uh, to Spain. He had three brothers who were killed in the conflict. And he gave up his own life. The, the, the emperor put a contract out on his life. And the first assassin just barely nicked him. But the second assassin got him good. On a Sunday morning, there he's lying at the bottom of the stairs on a Sunday morning, shot in the heart or shot in the chest. And his sister comes up to him and says, are you at peace with the Lord Jesus Christ? And his last words were, yes. And he died. But not before he had established peace and freedom for his people. And by the way, it wasn't just for the Protestants, but the Catholics too. He said, no, we're not going to touch the Catholics here. We're not going to persecute. We're stopping the madness. This is the first man who really stood up and with a clear mind said, no more of this religious persecution in the West. He was a man who committed himself to liberty. It's an incredible story. Wim the Silent is a man of God who did amazing things. And you know where, the, where it was all stopped? It was all stopped at Leiden. When the Spanish ships had come into Leiden... And they prayed and they prayed, and, and William the Silent had communicated letters. He was just outside of Leiden. He communicated the letters, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there some more. And uh, by God's grace, uh, he brought in the ocean waters over the dikes and swept out the, the Spanish. And that's where uh, the, the victory over the Spanish occurred. But here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I want you to understand. He died, William the Silent died about 1584, I'm going to say, do you know what happened about 15 to 20 years after that? There were a group of people called the Pilgrims in England that were, it was about 1609, and, and, and around that period of time, around the 1590s, three of the Pilgrim fathers, or three of the Pilgrim pastors, were hung by Queen Elizabeth for writing books on church discipline and church government. So they were hung, and they were killed. So it was, it was a bloody persecution that was just getting started. And so these Pilgrims were sitting around saying, well, where do we go? And you know where they went? They went to the Netherlands. They wound up in Leiden. And so here's what's very interesting. In history, this is the story of liberty. Listen to this. The worst hellhole on earth becomes the best place on earth and the safest place to take care of the pilgrims because of one man, William the Silent. Isn't it interesting what God does? The worst place on earth becomes the best place on earth. The most dangerous place becomes the safest place. Because of one man in, 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 in 20 years, in just 20 years. You see how God can turn the tide? Even as he turned the tide and brought the waters into Leiden, God can turn the tide. God can use a single person. Might God use one of you someday to turn the tide of history? For an entire nation. Here or somewhere else. I don't know. But, but here's the catalyst. Faith. In God's providence, He does act through a man who exercises faith. We see that with Moses. I believe Moses was the man of faith. The man for the hour. No, he didn't do anything. It was just faith. He raised a rod. But God said, that's good enough. I'll divide the waters. Salvation comes. So many great stories in history. What do we get? Well, one thing we know is that Jesus is bringing his enemies under his footstool. The devil doesn't give up easily. It's incredible the desperate straits we find people in. And then one person against the world. And then we find a breakthrough that follows.
Brothers and sisters, we need to stand against tyranny ourselves. We know that Christ will break through. We know he will overcome his enemies. But what is our role? To win? I ran for governor in 1994. It's just one voice. Just stood up. Brothers and sisters, somebody needs to stand up. You say, well, we're not a minor- major- majority. I know that. Maybe you're just one person. That's okay. Just stand. Stand. Christ will break through. As sure as God is God, as sure as Christ rules, He brings these things down. Let me go to the founding of this nation. I'll close here because the founding of this nation is such a great testimony. There was such a recognition of God's providential sovereignty over the nations. John Adams sitting next to Benjamin Rush in the Continental Congress in 1776. And Benjamin Rush whispers to him, is it possible we can win this conflict against this mighty tyrannical power, this, the world's largest, the most powerful empire on earth? Is it possible we could win? We're just a small a colony. We don't have as much support as we would like. And John Adams whispered to him, if we repent of our sins and fear God. That shows up in John Adams by David McAuliffe. I think one of the most outstanding moments in American history. Not to say John Adams was the best Christian in the world, but there was something of a fear of God, a recognition of God amongst our founders. But now let me tell you the story of the over-mountain men. After three years of conflict, things were going badly for the colonials, and they were no closer to winning the war. Between the fall of 1779, the summer of 1780, the Americans were facing the very worst of conditions. Now listen, this is how bad it was. The French Navy, allied to the colonial cause, had miserably failed in its attacks on Newport, Rhode Island, and Savannah, Georgia. So the French weren't helping. They called the French in to help. They weren't helping. In the most devastating setback of the war, General Clinton had captured Charleston on December 26, 1779. And then in May of 1780, the colonials suffered a tremendous loss at Waxhaws, resulting in the massacre of Virginians, and then to make matters worse, General Gates' troops were routed by British General Tarleton, a man known for his cruelty on August 16, 1780. In the north, Washington was confronting the problem of mutiny among his troops. Some of his regiments were going days without food, reminiscent of the Valley Forge days. He had also just received news of Benedict Arnold's treason. Circumstances could not have been worse. But during these highly critical weeks and months, Let's look at what the Continental Congress did. This is the body responsible for the administration of the war. Between the spring of 1780 and the spring of 1781, the Congress made three separate calls for national repentance and prayer. On April 28, 1780, the congressional delegates issued the first call, it having pleased the righteous governor of the world for the punishment of our manifold offenses. See here, concerned about our sins, our nation's sins. Not talking about how wicked the British are. You British are great people. I'm kidding around. But they they were talking about... (laughs) They were talking about their own transgressions. And that something says, to permit the sword of war still to harass our country, it becomes us to endeavor by humbling ourselves before God and turning from every evil way to avert His anger and obtain His favor and blessing with one heart, one voice, to implore the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth to remember His mercy in His judgments to make us sincerely penitent for our transgressions, to prepare for deliverance, and to renounce the evils with which he is pleased to visit us. Isn't that beautiful? Again, on October 17, 1780, the Continental Congress issued a call for another day of repentance and prayer, signed for December 7, 1780. The delegates instructed the people to assemble on that day to celebrate the praises of our divine benefactor, to confess our unworthiness of the least of his favors, and to offer our fervent supplications to the God of all graces that it may please him to pardon our heinous transgressions and incline our hearts for the future, listen, to keep all his laws and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread all over the world. Boy, there's something the Congress isn't going to do today, huh? Not going to see that anytime too soon. But here, acknowledging God as the source of law, acknowledging that it's for us to repent and a commitment to spread Christianity around the world, which, by the way, America became the, 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 the largest missionary supporting nation in the world by a long shot. We, we supported over 50% of the world's missionaries over, say, about 150 years. But what happened? By God's grace, the nation humbled itself. Three calls 
for repentance, fasting, and prayer on the part of the Continental Congress. But now listen, what happened? Was it George Washington? Did George Washington start to win? Did George Washington press in? Did the great armies do something? No, it was the Overmountain Men from Tennessee. How many of you heard of the Overmountain Men from Tennessee? All right, okay, you all been educated, but I'm educating our British friend down here. <laughs> he said he wants to know more American history so he can be a better preacher in Tennessee. So here you go, brother. But here's what's really interesting. God used this small group of Presbyterians out here in Tennessee to change the course of history. And the troops mustered to Sycamore Shoals. I just did a Google Maps on my iPhone to Sycamore Shoals. It's nine minutes from here. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. I'm actually, I'm actually teaching on Sycamore Shoals and the, 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 the mustering of the Overmountain Men in Tennessee. I'm, I'm three miles from that point. Let's all go there now. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, maybe some of us can go. Maybe we'll just jump into the truck later on and go on down there. But uh, the Presbyterian pastor, Samuel Doak, preached the message, didn't he? It was one of the most famous mess messages in American history, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And remember his closing prayer. Listen to this. Almighty and gracious God, thou hast been the refuge and the strength of thy people in all ages. In time of our sorest need, we have learned to come to thee, our rock and our fortress. Thou knowest the dangers and snares that surround us on march and in battle. Thou knowest the dangers that constantly threaten the humble, but well-beloved homes, which thy servants have left behind them. Oh, in thine infinite mercy, save us from the cruel hand of the savage and tyrant. Save the unprotected homes, while fathers and husbands and sons are far away fighting for freedom and helping the oppressed. Thou who promised to protect the sparrow at his flight, keep ceaseless watch by day and night over our loved ones, the helpless women and little children we commit to thy care. Thou will not leave them nor forsake them in times of loneliness and anxiety and terror. O oh God of battle, arise in thy might. Avenge the slaughter of thy people. Confound those who plot for their destruction. Crown this mighty effort with victory and smite those who exalt themselves against liberty and justice and truth. Help us as good soldiers to wield the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Amen. Well, what happened? It was the most amazing battle in American revolutionary war for independence history. It was the shortest battle, an extremely decisive battle. It occurred on October 7, 1780. The British general, Ferguson, had boasted this, I will be king of the mountain. That is King's Mountain where the battle occurred. He said, I will be king of that mountain. And even God Almighty could not remove me from it. Uh, mental note, don't ever say that. <laughs> God removed him from the mountain, basically, is what happened. In one hour, Ferguson's army was shattered. The British lost 1,100 men to the mountain men's 28. It was a psychological blow to the Brits. The next momentous battle occurred on January 17, 1781, also on the southern front. British General Tarleton pursued Brigadier General Daniel Morgan with 1,100 British troops through the South Carolina backcountry for weeks. Finally, Morgan elected to take the stand at a broad meadowland called Calpins on January 17th. The Americans were outnumbered again, but it was a complete rout in favor of the colonials. Almost the entire British force was either dead or captured by the end of that battle. And Tarleton fled the battlefield alone. This concluded a series of battles secured by the disparaged motley band of Presbyterians. General Daniel Morgan was also a devout Presbyterian layman of Welsh background. Reports have it that General Morgan rode across the field of Calpens, praising God for the victory. Later, he recorded these words concerning the Battle of Calpens. Such was the inferiority of our numbers that our success must be attributed to God, to the justice of our cause and the bravery of our troops. An Irish Presbyterian soldier from the Carolina backcountry described the battle more plainly in his prayer. Good Lord, our God that art in heaven... We have great reason to thank thee for the many battles we have won. The great and glorious battle of King's Mountain and the ever glorious and memorable battle of the Cowpens where we made the proud General Carlton run down the road, Helder Skelter. <laughs> I love these country boy Presbyterians. Still a few of them in the audience, I take it. And General George Washington also recognized the importance of these battles and the providential hand of God. He says, The many remarkable interpositions of the divine government and the hours of our deepest distress and darkness have been too luminous to suffer me to doubt the happy issues of the present contest. And it really was King's Mountain and Cal Pens that turned the whole 
thing around. And George Washington came down, wrapped it up at Yorktown. So that's the, just the way it ended. But it didn't end because of General Washington. It happened because of the providential hand of God upon a few Presbyterians down here at Kings Mountain in South Carolina. Well, what do we do now? I know we're out of time, but what do we do? And what's the expectation for those of you who are here? I hope you're inspired. I hope you're, you're receiving the message. Tag your it. Act in faith. Step out in faith. Doesn't matter if you're alone. Just stand. Stand for God. Stand for truth. Stand for the Word of God. I think right now, we are going to be tested on whether or not we're going to stand for what the Word of God says about homosexuality. It's going to be these ethical issues. I know it's a different issue pretty much every generation or two or three or five or six, but you're probably going to have to stand for Romans 1 or Leviticus 18. You're probably just going to have to stand for the ethical standards of God's Word. Every word of that, that Word, the Word of God. Stand on it. Do not be ashamed of God's words. Not one word of it. Stand in faith. Here's one more thing. Evangelize everywhere. Get the gospel out of the closet. There's no reason to be shy about evangelizing. Because you know that this nation is doomed unless there's revival. And the revival needs to start in the churches. Be nice if people get saved in our churches first. And then it spreads throughout the country. Uh, nobody can exempt themselves from the grace of God either. Whether you have this sin or that sin. They might say, I'm a homosexual, I don't need the grace of God. You say, no, no, you need it too. Nobody exempts himself from the grace of God. We, we preach the gospel, we pray. Let's repent of our sins. Let's seek total deliverance from those sins that have a grip on us. If you've got handcuffs still somewhat around you because of a certain kind of idolatry, whether it be pornography or it's addiction to this or that, or whether it be an addiction to self-image, or just the addiction, the, the idolatry of self-centeredness, or whatever it is, may God deliver you from that. May you look to the cross of Jesus Christ and, and, and know the meaning of it and see the redemption of Jesus. He bought your redemption at that cross. It's for you to believe it. So repent, believe. Here's one more thing. Despise tyranny. Oppose tyranny at every level whether it be the tyranny that binds us to our sins or whatever it is, despise it. Hate the tyranny. Desire to shake off the handcuffs of your sin by the power of the risen Christ. And oppose the tyranny that acts at every level in government as well. While the world is killing 67% of their babies, by surgical abortions, the IUD, and other forms of abortifacients, we're adopting. We're doing just the opposite. While the world is euthanizing 80 million baby boomers, the churches and our families, we're adopting the elderly, caring for the aging parents and grandparents. That's, that's what we're doing. While the world is spending their great-grandchildren to debt, we're leaving an inheritance for our children's children. While the world is full of lost boys, prisons filled up with fatherless boys, while marriages and economies and Civilizations are a total disaster because 55% of these little boys and girls are born without fathers. What are we doing? The Christian church is filling up with men who are loved by their father and, and, and they know the love of the father for them and they share the love of the father with their own sons and daughters and they invest hundreds of hours into discipleship of their own boys and girls and there are others within the church that are discipling the young men and young women that are wandering in and they're the refugees coming in from the camps outside of the churches. But we're learning to love one another and we're, we're investing our time, our resources into loving each other and discipling our sons and daughters, whether they be spiritual sons and daughters or our physical sons and daughters. And we do that because Jesus has loved us and he's given himself for us. That's how we break the back of tyranny. That's how we do it. I think the Christian church is the only hope for society. This is the only hope. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope. The preaching of the word of God is the only hope. And the church is a, a miracle of God where we are the transformed. We are the walking, talking, transformed miracles of the living God. That's who we are in the body of the church. I'll close with 1 Thessalonians 1. Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, how you turned to God from idols 
to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven when He raised Him from the dead. Even Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. What He's saying here is these were guys who were in bondage to sin, in bondage to all these horrible things. We wrote another book called Preparing the World for Jesus in which we outlined this horrible tyranny that was spreading across the incapability of man to save himself by his empires. But here they are, the Thessalonians, in bondage to sin for thousands of years. And uh, within what, 5, 10, 15 years, they're transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, set free from their sins. And again, as the Son of God told us, if the Son will make you free, you will be free indeed. Amen and amen. You're dismissed. Or is it...